to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ every child of god is in a spiritual battle for his eternal soul. And the Word of God says, fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6, verse number 12. You can be sure that our enemy, the devil, is walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's going to and fro, back and forth on the earth, looking for people to tempt and deceive to be lost. Job 1, verse number 6 following. What am I going to do and what are you going to do to overcome our enemy Satan and to win the great battle? Friend, the good news is the battle has been won in heaven. Hebrews 2 verse 14, Jesus through death overcame him, the power, him who had the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Jesus has defeated the devil spiritually and friend, if I'm faithful to God, I can win the battle as well, but I'm going to have to fight it. I'm going to have to arm myself and I'm going to have to be prepared for war against Satan every day. We welcome you to our study of the whole armor of God. What am I to take up? How am I to live my life? What things do I have at my disposal? What tools, what armory do I have to win the battle? Well, friend, God has equipped every Christian to win that battle and to be victorious. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I can and I will be victorious if I'm faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10. But to do that, I've got to be well equipped and well armed spiritually in this life. And those are the things this morning or today that we're going to be thinking about as we study about the spiritual battle and the whole armor of God. And so we hope you got your Bible handy and that you'll be looking along with us in better efforts to prepare ourselves to defeat Satan and make it to heaven. Now as we think about, as we think about today the whole armor of God and our spiritual battle uh, to overcome Satan, you've got to recognize, I've got to recognize that I am in a battle for my eternal soul. Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. Did you hear those words as Paul started that verse out? Though we walk in the flesh, yes, I've got a fleshly body. I live in a fleshly world. Uh, I, I cannot deny that fact, nor can you. But friend, though we walk in the flesh, Paul says we do not war according to the flesh. Our battle every day, the real battle every day, is a spiritual battle. We live a fleshly life. Genesis 2 verse 7, God created man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. I have to live in this earthly tabernacle that I'm in right now, but it's a spiritual battle that I fight. Fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 1 18 and 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse number 12. The, Paul would say the, we, we're in a, a spiritual battle against the spiritual host of darkness in the present age. We're fighting against sin, we're fighting against Satan, and we're fighting temptation on every hand. And friend, to overcome and to win this battle, I've got to make sure that I don't get too attached and caught up in the affairs of this life. 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, the Bible says that a good soldier of Jesus Christ, he doesn't get caught up in the affairs of this life or the world. He stays focused on God and what God wants him to do. Remember Mark 12 verse 30? 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what, that's what life is all about. And so as we live this life and as we strive to do what God wants us to, I've got to be completely devoted to winning the battle and staying strong in this fight. But friend, part of winning the battle is knowing you're in a battle, but also a big part of winning the battle, winning any kind of competition, winning any kind of war, winning any kind of game, a big part of that winning is knowing your opponent as well. You know, you take, for example, maybe a football game or a basketball game, and, you know, if a, a good team and a good coach is going to examine their opponent, is going to look at their strengths, is going to look at their weaknesses, and is going to create a game plan to overcome the enemy or the opponent. Well, friend, Satan is the spiritual opponent. And if I'm going to win the battle, I need to know my opponent. The Bible says that our opponent, he is looked at as the God of this world. That is, by worldly people, he's the one who's in control of their lives and whether they know it or not. He's the one whom they serve and worship. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 4. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And so Satan's the, the God of this world, or the God of this age, as it were. He is described in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15, as presenting himself as an angel of light. Looks good, looks shiny, looks like something you might want to be involved in or have. Friend, at last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. It may look good, it may seem good, it may sound right. But we always need to check and make sure, according to the Word of God, that it's what He wants us to do. You know, when you think about the opponent, here's another thing to consider. Not only is He the one in control of the people of this world, not only does some of the things He do seem and look and feel as though it were light or right, but you need to realize as well, I need to realize as well, Satan is very conniving and he is a very wily opponent. Ephesians chapter 6 verse number 11 and 1 Timothy 3 verse 7 warns us of the wiles or the trickery of the devil. How could we best describe the devil? The devil is the best con artist you've ever met. You ever heard of people who were really good or known people who were really good con artists? They could con people out of their money. They could sell them some grand scheme that wasn't legit to begin with. But somehow they could get their money or they could get them involved in something. And before you know it, the joke's on you as it were. Satan is the greatest, most conniving con artist you've ever met. He will convince you to sell him your soul. He will get you involved in so many things you can't put God first. He'll deceive you morally. He'll corrupt you in any way possible. And friend, I need to know ahead of time, going into the battle, that he is a smooth-talking, smooth-acting salesman who is only trying to con me out of what is right and good. Satan is described in the Bible as a liar and a murderer. John 8, verse 44, he is the father of lies. He's a murderer from the beginning. Take your mind back to Genesis chapter 3 for just a moment. God said to Adam and Eve, uh, you can have anything in the Garden of Eden except you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat it, you'll die. And Satan said, did God say you couldn't do that? Why did God say that? He doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be a God as well. He's trying to hold you back as it were. And he sold them that false, uh, sold them that lie. And they bought it. And death came to them. Think about just one chapter forward. Genesis chapter 4, Cain murdered his brother Abel, and no doubt Satan was behind the jealousy, the envy, and the strife there. Friend, if you think Satan's just a good old boy, realize this. He cost Adam and Eve their soul. He was the culprit behind the murder of Cain and Abel. And he'll cost me my soul, and he'll deceive and, and destroy people today quicker than we can even begin to realize it. He is a devourer, a devourer of souls. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Look at the picture here. He's a lion. He's trying to devour something. Well, in the spiritual sense, Satan wants to devour and consume us spiritually. And so be on guard. 
be alert of who the enemy is, and in so doing, you're prepared for the opponent. Now, let's ask these questions then. Or let's think about these principles as it relates to overcoming the devil. What has God given me? And what has He given you to help us defeat the devil? Remember, God wants us to be victorious. We are well equipped in every way. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Well, how am I equipped to defeat Satan? God has given me the perfect armor to make sure that Satan isn't able to penetrate or infiltrate my life and yours. I want you to notice that armor with me in Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verses 10 through 18 with me and notice what the scripture says. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You know, when you think about, when you think about an, uh, an armor, when you think about maybe medieval armor, and uh, as though it were an, uh, one who is filled in that armor, well, think about the different parts of that armor. And friend, the Bible describes each of these parts as being something I need to put on so that I can win the battle against Satan. Now, let's take just a few moments to think about the individual parts of the Christian armor and how important they are. Paul says we need to have the belt of truth. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 14, we have our waist girded with the belt of truth. You know, when you think about a belt, it kind of holds everything together, ties everything together. It's essential to keep both the top and the bottom part of the armory connected. Well, friend, that's the belt of truth. Spiritually speaking, if everything's going to stay connected and I'm going to be fully protected, the belt of truth is what holds that together. You know, a question was asked by Pilate in John 18, verses 36 through 38, where he said, what is truth? And yet Jesus had already answered that. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. When we talk about the belt of truth, friend, we're talking about girding our waist, being completely attached together, as it were, with the word of God. John 8, 32, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth, will make you free. You see, God's Word is that lamp to our feet and that light to our path. Psalm 119, verse 105. And friend, whatever it cost, the proverb writer said, truth is worth it. Buy the truth and sell it not. And friend, here's the good news. This book right here, the Bible, is all truth. John 16, verse number 13, Jesus prayed that the Father, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He would guide you into all truth. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 says, In the Bible we have everything we need for life and godliness. What is it that completely joins the Christian's armor together? Truth is what we need to be committed to so that everything can be bound together as it ought. A second part then of the Christian armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, when you think about a breastplate, that which protects the lungs and the heart and the internal organs, that which keeps our, our heart and, and life pure, as it were, it's the breastplate of righteousness. 
if I'm going to be fully protected against the devil, I have got to set before my life and before my heart the mindset that I'm going to do what's right. Whatever God wants me to do, I'm going to try my best to do it. I'm going to live right. I'm going to, I'm going to try to act right. I'm going to try to do what God wants me to do. Matthew 6, I'm going to try to seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness. I'm going to do as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Without holiness, no one can see God. You see, it was God who said in the long ago, in Leviticus 11, verse 44, and repeated in 1 Peter 1, verse 15, Be holy as He who called you is holy. I want to think on the things that are good and right and noble and pure in the sight of God. And I want to have that attitude. Whatever God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do in this life. More than anything, if I can make up my mind, and if you can make up your mind, if we can make the decision that we're going to try our best to live right, to act right, to think right, to avoid that which is evil, friend, you're putting on the breastplate of righteousness, and Satan cannot penetrate that if we try to live as God wants us to. Then a third part of that Christian armor, Paul says, we have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is, as it were, the gospel boots or the gospel shoes, we might say. We're prepared by putting on the gospel, and wherever our feet go, the gospel goes with us. You see, as I prepare myself, I, I'm studying. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, study to show yourself approved unto God. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says, we're to be ready always. And friend, if I've got the Word of God in my heart and mind, wherever my feet go, the gospel goes as well. I have the ability to award off Satan. Listen to Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12. How can a young man cleanse his way, the psalmist said, by taking heed according to your word. Now listen to this. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, boots are such an essential part of any soldier's uh, armory, as it were. Without a good pair of boots, you won't go very far. If your feet sweat, if they get wet, if you get blisters and you get sores and your feet are not protected, you're no good as a soldier. Well, friend, what are those boots? What is that, that shoe that is to equip us? Having our feet shod with the preparation, the prepared gospel in our hearts and in our lives helps us to put one foot in front of the other and walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2, verse number 21. And then Paul mentions as part of the Christian's armor, the shield of faith. Having the shield of faith by which we'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You know, there's an interesting image that comes from some of the language in Ephesians chapter 6, the original language. Uh, the shield here would often be not only just a, a metal shield as you would see, but sometimes they would be wooden and sometimes they would have leather over those and that leather would then be soaked in some wet solution to keep it wet and as though they're approaching a city and archers shoot, arch, uh, shoot arrows that have uh, fiery arrows as it were, they hit that shield and as soon as they hit it, the fire goes out. Can't set it on fire, can't, can't create more havoc. That shield has the power to put out that fire and to protect the soldier from the arrows. Friend, that's the idea as it relates to the Christian. Satan is shooting those arrows at us. Sin is trying to pierce that armor. It's trying to find a chink in that armor. Doubt, uh, d discouragement, sin, whatever it may be, is trying to find a way into that armor. And it is with the shield of faith that we're able to ward off all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You see, faith has the ability to overcome. 1 John 5 verse 4, this is the victory we have, even our faith. Faith helps me and it helps you as a Christian to be victorious. Now, what is faith? Well, it's more than just I think or I feel or maybe. It's conviction based on the Word of God. Faith comes by reading the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing 
by the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. It's, it's substance. It's evidence. It's, it, it's fact. It's knowing that God is real and that I can trust Him always. And friend, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And then, friend, as we think about the Christian armor, and especially as we think about defeating Satan being a spiritual battle and oftentimes a battle of the mind, the Bible gives us the perfect helmet. We have, according to Ephesians 6, 17, the helmet of salvation. You know, if you don't have a helmet in a, in a battle and you get hit in the head, it may hurt you internally, you may have brain damage, you're not able to think, you may not be able to see, you may be able to function in uh, the, way God, the way you ought to. But friend, spiritually speaking, how important is a helmet for a Christian? It's, it's the most, one of the most important ideas because Satan wants to work in my mind. He wants to get in my heart. And so I've got to protect my mind and my heart with the helmet of salvation. Now, you think about salvation as a helmet and how does that help? Well, friend, if I've obeyed the gospel, I've been saved, right? Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 42 following, you've got the example of the Ethiopian eunuch. And when that man obeyed the gospel, he came up out of the water. He was saved and he knew it and he went on his way rejoicing. He had hope. He had purpose. Death could no longer defeat him. Death had been defeated in Christ and he could now live faithful unto death knowing that he's right with God. Friend, if I've obeyed the gospel, I'm a Christian. Salvation is that helmet. And no matter what Satan throws at me, no matter how the world tries to assault me, if I'm faithful unto death, I'll receive the crown of life. Revelation 2, verse number 10. Even death cannot defeat us. Revelation 14, verse 13, the Bible says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Remember Psalm 116, verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. And friends, since our battle is a spiritual battle, since we are bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 verse number 5, knowing that I've obeyed the gospel, my sins have been washed away, and that I am a Christian, that I'm heaven bound, encourages me even greater than in any other way to ward off Satan. Why do you not want to give in to Satan's temptation? Why do you not want to go down the path that leads to destruction? So I have the pearl of great price. I'm a Christian. I have a reservation in heaven. My name is reserved in God's book of life. And if I live faithful and if I don't give up, one day I can live with God forever in heaven. And you talk about something that protects you. It's knowing you're saved. 1 John 5 verse 13, These things we write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe, knowing that you're saved ought to encourage each one of us to never ever give up on the hope of salvation. And then we talk about that last part of the Christian armor. You know, I can, I can have the breastplate of righteousness. I can have the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation. I can have a good shield. I can prepare my feet with the correct boots, the gospel of peace. But what tool am I going to take to defend myself? The sword of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and we're to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, not only am I defending myself, but I can use that sword against the devil. How do we know that? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was tempted by Satan in three ways. If you're the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Cast yourself all the temple. All these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus unsheathed that sword and said every time, It is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus used that tool, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to defeat the devil. And friend, we can do the same thing as well today. Do you remember the words of Hebrews 4 verse 12? The Word of God is living and powerful, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If there's one thing that the Satan surely fears, it is God and His divine Word. And friend, if I'll put that Word in my heart and in my mind, it'll help me to overcome Satan and his temptation. We want to we speak the truth in love. There's no doubt about that. But I want to let God's sword which is sharper than any knife you could ever have, sharper than any sword you could ever imagine, tougher than any sword that's ever made. I'm going to use it to defend myself in the greatest battle ever. Now, friend, as we mentioned, that battle is still raging on today, and Satan is trying to do everything possible to cause men to be lost and to come to his side. God's already been victorious, as we've seen. Hebrews 2, 14, and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But that doesn't mean the devil doesn't want to take people to hell with him. He absolutely does. Don't let that be you. Don't, we don't, I don't want that to be me. God doesn't want that to be me or you. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. How do you prepare yourself against the battle? Well, first and foremost, if you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, you put on that helmet of salvation initially by becoming a Christian. In Acts chapter 2, as Peter stood up and for the very first time proclaimed salvation in Jesus, here was his statement. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They realized that truth. They were cut to the heart. And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was this, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. They believed in Christ. They then needed to repent and change their ways, turn from sin and to God, and they needed to be immersed in water, baptized for the remission of their sins. Have you done that, my friend? Have you obeyed the gospel? Is that helmet of salvation yours? If so, then continue to put that armor on. Make sure that we're properly shod, that we're not letting any chinks in that armor, and that we're doing everything we can every day to be faithful unto God so that we can hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. May God help each of us to win the battle against Satan. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.